Well, good morning. How's everybody doing today? You know, a lot of people talked about winter here in Washington, and I'm pretty much concluded you're all liars. Because I think it's sunny and beautiful every day, to which everyone says, oh, just wait. <laughs> uh, growing up, my, my family were a part of the Rotary Club, and uh, that may or may not mean something to you. Some of you might know who, what Rotary is. Uh, some of you don't. Um, the, one of the things they're kind of known for is pancake breakfast. Like, Rotary does epic pancake breakfast. And growing up where I did in, in, in California, uh, my parents were part of a Rotary Club, and every year they would do this citywide pancake breakfast, and all of the proceeds that were raised from that were given to the local YMCA. And so it was a pretty cool event, but the reality is, uh, when my parents, that my family was a part of Rotary, when every year it came to the pancake breakfast, guess what? It meant I was a part of the pancake breakfast. And let me just be honest, there, there's, there's a, about a hundred things wrong with this pancake breakfast and teenagers. One, it was super early in the morning. Like we had to get up early to get down to the, the local high school to set up and start cooking. And like teenagers, are, they're, just, like, they're not wired to wake up before like 11 a.m. So, like, that didn't work. Uh, you know, it's funny. I, I, I didn't like it because it was cold, but it was like a California cold, so it was like 50 degrees. And uh, now I'm like, it's 50 degrees, yes! Like, it's so warm! Um, so that's ironic. Uh, the third thing was, like, just people didn't seem to be that grateful. Like, you know, it's like you'd work hard, and they'd be like, oh, you overcooked my pancake, or, you know, your Mickey Mouse is a little misshapen, and I'm like, I'm, I'm 11, give me a break. Like, what do you, what do you want from me here? And, and so, like, every year... I would try to come up with a reason why I didn't have to participate in the pancake breakfast. Like, I, you know, I would say, oh, hey, um, uh, you know, uh, I'm sick. Like, let me, I just don't feel good. I try to, you know, fake that. I'm like, I don't want to get everyone else sick. And my parents are like, too bad. You'll be better in a couple days. Come make pancakes. Uh, I, I would take up interest in reading because, you know, every parent loves when their kid reads. And so I would, like, pick up a book, like, a day beforehand. I'd be like, oh, I don't, I got to finish this book because, like, I, I probably can't go to the pancake breakfast. And they're like, no, you can finish the book later. Go ahead and come. I thought my ultimate excuse was I would spend the night at a friend's house because then I wouldn't be there. I wouldn't be, when they woke up, they, they couldn't get me. And sure enough, I went to a friend's house, and early in the morning, knock, knock, my parents are at my friend's house, like, come on, it's pancake breakfast day. Like, it's time to go make some pancakes. And I'm not even kidding. Like, when I... When I thought to myself, like, when I become an adult, I'm so excited to become an adult because I will never have to serve again. Like, I thought, like, this, this is why people want to be adults. Like, they get, they get out of this stuff. And uh, the funny thing is, when I became an adult and I started to serve and be a part of things, I realized why my parents did it. Like, I realized some of the joy that's a part of when you, when you leverage some of yourself, some of your time, some of your talents to the benefit uh, of others. And so I, I began to experience that. But if I'm being perfectly honest, not every single service opportunity was like that. And you can probably relate to that. There's probably been things in your life where you've been a part of and you've served and you're like, this is wonderful. And then there's other things where you're like, I, I wish I didn't have to do this. I wish this didn't come. And, and I started thinking, why is that? Like, why do we feel that way? And I think part of it is because uh, we struggle with the proper perspective when it comes to serving. Uh, Stanford University, they did a research study, and they wanted to kind of look into Americans' volunteering or serving habits. And so they literally polled thousands of people, and what they found was that 90% of Americans wanted to serve. They wanted to. But only one in four, or 25% of people, actually did. And so they started to ask all sorts of questions as to why. Like, why aren't, if so many people want to do this, why is it that very few people actually do? And this is a couple of the responses that they found. The first, and this is not going to be surprising, is one, of the, one of the biggest um, reasons for not serving was simply this, that I don't have enough time. Like, people felt like they didn't have enough time to do the things that they wanted to do. What was interesting about this is they found that retired people actually served significantly less than people the ages 35 to 44, often people with kids and with full-time jobs. And so what that tells us is it's probably not a time issue. 
Now, someone came to me after first service and said, hey, you need to understand that, like, when you're 35 and 40 to 44, you have, like, an eight-hour day that you work, but when you're retired, you actually work 24 hours a day. And so I just, I, I'm, I'm just the messenger, okay? This is Stanford's research. It's not me. But that was interesting. It's interesting that people, arguably with more time, actually serve less. One of the other things they found is most people say this. They'll say that most opportunities aren't interesting. Like they don't align with their passion. They're not excited about serving in these areas. And, 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 that, and that's part of how most of us are driven. Like we want to give of our time and to give to, of our energy into places that we're passionate about. But one of the things that we need to wrestle with is that those areas are not always the places of biggest need. And so uh, it's not bad. It's not bad to want to serve in an area that you're passionate about, but we have to literally ask ourselves, if there isn't a significant need or if there's greater need elsewhere, is it probably more beneficial for us to go and to serve someplace else? And I think we need to wrestle with this truth that we don't serve for us. We serve for others. That yes, we benefit, but that's not the primary reason we do it. I tell you all this because this morning, as we continue in our Jesus series, we're going to be looking at this idea of service. We intentionally called this series Jesus. And last week, if you weren't here, one of the things that we talked about is we talked about how the world has so many different perspectives and views about who Jesus is. People think he's a revolutionary or he's just a man, but nothing else. And one of the things I shared last week is I said, look, the people who knew Jesus best, both in biblical times and today, seem to have the clearest picture of exactly who Jesus is. And those people would simply say this, that Jesus is love. That that's who Jesus is. And that's how he engages with humanity. And the point of this series is to then go through and to begin to unpack what this love looks like. And so last week, we talked about this attribute of love that Jesus displays where he meets us in our difficult seasons. He meets us where we're at, and he meets our needs. And this week, as we continue to unpack this idea of love, we're going to look at love through the lens of service. That one of the ways that Jesus loves us is that he serves us. Now, I understand, giving your perspective on God, that might seem a bit odd. And maybe you're thinking, well, no, hold on. You've got that wrong, Mike. We serve Jesus. We serve God. He doesn't serve us. But the truth is, as you begin to unpack the pages of Scripture, what you come to realize is one of the principal reasons that Jesus even came into this world is to serve all of humanity. But I realize I just simply can't tell you that Jesus is here to serve you. We need to look at some examples. And to do that, we're actually going to look at a story that is found in John chapter 13. John is one of the Gospels. It's one of the four books that tell us about the life of Jesus. And in in John 13, we're we're going to unpack a story that is familiar to maybe a lot of you, whether you've kind of been in church your whole life or maybe you've just never been in church. But it's one of those things that you've probably heard in your life. Uh, In John 13, as we kind of just dive in, give you some background, some kind of understanding of where we find ourselves in the story of Scripture, uh, John 13, we see that people are gathering for what is called the, um, the Passover festival. And the Passover festival is a celebration to remind people about what God has done when he helped lead his people out of captivity in Egypt, out of slavery in Egypt, and into, the, into freedom and into the promised land. And so all of Israel would stop every single year to remember and to celebrate what God has done. And people would do that in like kind of the locations where they're at, but there was also literally thousands of people that would make their way to Jerusalem to celebrate that together. And so what we see here in John 13 is there are people who have gathered. We are in Jerusalem in this story, and Jesus has come there with some of his disciples, his closest followers, to be a part of this Passover festival. 
And the thing is, as you can imagine, is literally thousands of people descend on a city. There's energy and there's excitement and there's a lot that's going on. But in the midst of all of this, Jesus wants to separate for a moment. He wants to spend some time with his disciples. And so sure enough, that's what they do. They gather together to share a night and to share a meal together. This is the words of Jesus that we find in John chapter 13, beginning in verse 3. Jesus knew... Jesus knew that the Father had put all things, everything, under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So basically, Jesus knows that his time is limited. Like He, he came from God. He's going to go back to God. He's only got so much more time left to minister and to be with the people that he loves and that he's leading. And at the same time, the text also tells us that Jesus has all the power. Like, he can do whatever he wants. He's got limited time, but he can do whatever he wants with that limited time. So what does Jesus do? This is what he says. So we read. So Jesus got up from the meal. He took off his outer clothing, and he wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. So again, Jesus could have done anything, anything. But in this moment, with all of the power and all of the authority in the world, he decides to get up and to serve his disciples. We're told that he takes this this outer clothing off. It's almost like a robe around him, and he puts a, a towel around his waist, and he begins to pour in a basin water And as he fills the basin, what he then begins to do is he begins to wash the disciples' feet. Now that in itself is an incredible act. Like I think we would probably all agree that like washing someone's feet is not a glamorous thing. Matter of fact, I kind of wanted us to get into like the mindset of what Jesus would have been experiencing or what people in that day would be experiencing. So if our volunteers can come forward with the basins of water, we're actually going to wash everyone's feet right— Why are you laughing? (laughs) Go ahead and start taking off your shoes. I'm just kidding. The truth is, you know, if if I did that right now, like, probably half of you would be like, how can we get out of here as quickly as possible? Because it's kind of gross. It's not kind of gross. It's gross. Now take that feeling and multiply it by 10. Because in Jesus' day, the roads were unpaved. They were dusty. And the best of circumstances is you walked on these roads, you would just get your feet covered with dust. In the worst days when it was rainy, you'd be literally walking through mud. And people here, they didn't have shoes that covered their whole feet. They They were sandals. It was basically a sole with some straps around the top of it. And so people's feet were completely disgusting. And when you came to a person's house, when you showed up at their house, one of the things that they would do is they would wash your feet. It was kind of this ritual. It was part of what you would experience. Now, sure enough, they come into this house, and no one washes their feet. That should have been done by a servant. But it's not. It's instead done by Jesus. Now maybe you're asking, well, where's the servant? Where's the person who's supposed to wash their feet? Now we don't fully know that. What we do know is that they're not in their home, hometown area, which is Galilee. Jesus himself doesn't have a home. Some of the disciples would have had a home. Um, but they're on the road. They're traveling. We don't seem to, to, to know that they have been invited over to someone's house who would be wealthy enough to have servants to do this. For all we know, they could have airbnb a place. But this is where they're at. And they show up, and there is no servant. There's no one to wash the feet of all who've gathered, and I have to imagine everyone's kind of looking around. Like, they're looking around like, sure enough, that Peter's going to do that, and like, Peter's like, no, I think John's going to go ahead and take care of that, and like, they're all wondering who's going to step up and take on the posture and the position of a servant. And so Jesus does that. It's exactly what Jesus does. We're told he comes to Simon Peter, and Simon says to him, Lord, 
are you going to wash my feet? Like, it's literally like Peter's looking at this. This is happening. He's thinking at first, okay, Jesus is getting up. He's making this grand, you know, show. He's, you know, he's pouring, pouring water in the basin. But surely, surely he's not going to wash my feet. But as, as Jesus approaches him, Peter's like, for real? Like, this is happening. Like, I, I'm not okay with this. Like, Peter is not okay with it. You can even see it uh, in, in what he says. Look at what Peter says next. I'm sorry. Look at what Jesus says next. Uh, Jesus says to him, look, he says, you don't realize, you don't realize what I'm doing, but later, later you will understand. So again, he comes to begin washing the disciples' feet. Peter's like, I don't, I'm not okay with this. This is not, this is not something I'm, I'm going to let you do, Jesus. And Jesus is like, look, you don't understand what I'm doing in this moment. You don't understand what I'm getting at. But later, you will. Because in this moment, what you're thinking is you're thinking, look, you're just here to serve me, which is partly what Jesus is doing. But what Jesus is referencing is saying, look, in a short time, I'm going to give my life, not just for you, but in an act of service for all of humanity. You don't understand what I'm doing now, but later you will understand. To which we would hope at this moment Peter would be like, oh, well, I totally get it, Lord. Then, then, then do what you have planned. But this is not what Peter does. Peter says, no. <laughs> He's like a child. I feel like I'm dealing with my kids here. No, says Peter, you shall never wash my feet. I mean, think about this. Like, he is so convinced that he is right. That he is literally looking at Jesus and saying, I know what you have planned. You have made it clear your intentions, but I will not let you. Will not allow you to do the thing that you are about to do. Because Peter is probably like so many of us thinking, look, Jesus doesn't serve us. We serve Jesus. And this is what Jesus says in response to Peter. Jesus answered him, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Unless I wash you, Peter, then you have no part with me. Now, to understand what's going on here, we need to understand some of the cultural context. Because I can tell you, when Jesus would have said these words, it would have caused everyone to stop. Everyone would have understood the intensity and the magnitude of these words and of that moment. You see, in the ancient world, when you would prepare yourself to be a part of a festival, there was a cleansing process that you would go take a bath. But it's not, it's not any old bath. It's a ceremonial cleansing bath. And there's certain things that you have to do about when it comes to that. There's certain times that it needs to happen to prepare yourself to enter in and to celebrate the festival, to be a part of what God is doing. And what we know is for everyone who would have come and gathered here in Jerusalem, they all would have gone through this process. They all would have experienced this ceremonial cleansing. And so when they would come and when they would end up in the places that they would stay, when they walked into someone's house, the, the servant there would wash their feet because that's all that needed to be washed. The rest of them was cleansed and prepared for the ceremony. But the thing is, Jesus is getting at something a whole lot more significant here than feet. What Jesus is getting at is he's getting at baptism. You see, the cleansing of a person's feet was often referred to as the ceremony that grants permission for entrance. And there's a symbolism here because in the early church they would refer to baptism in the same manner, that baptism is the ceremony of cleansing that grants permission. You see, everyone who gathered in the house would have had their feet cleaned. It was part of what they held in common. And the same is true of the church today, that those of us who've submitted our lives to Jesus as Lord, we hold in common the cleansing of baptism. It's this acknowledgement that we have died to ourselves, that we have left our old selves behind, but we have been raised to walk a new life in this new experience with Jesus. Now, here's where things get a little tricky. 
Because you look at this passage and you think, okay, Jesus says, unless I wash you, unless I baptize you, you have no part with me. You're like, wait a second here. Are you saying that unless we're baptized, then we cannot be saved? That's not at all what I'm saying. And that is not at all what Jesus is saying. See, this word, this word part, is the Greek word meros. And that word is translated really most commonly in one of two ways. One of those ways is the word part. One of the other significant ways is the word share. And when you look through various translations of Scripture, you will see these words used interchangeably. So what Jesus is saying, he's not saying, look, unless you are baptized, you have no part with me. What Jesus is saying to the disciples is, look, unless you are baptized, you don't share with me. You don't share that experience. You don't understand the significance of what this act means. And what Jesus wants the disciples to do is he wants them to know that. He wants them to share in it. And the truth is he wants the same for us today. You see, as those who have been called to be followers of Christ, we are called to submit our lives in every way to the teachings, but also to the example of who Jesus was. And he led out in a model by submitting himself to baptism because he wanted all of us to be able to share in that same experience. He wanted to share in the experience for so much of the early church. He wanted that to be a part of their community. Now I tell you this because in two weeks, on December 2nd, we're going to be having baptisms that weekend. And I want you to consider getting baptized. If you've never done it before, not because you have to, not because you won't be saved if you don't, but because you want to experience the same experiences that Jesus had. You see, I think a lot of us, we find ourselves on the outside looking in. We're on the outside of the house, and we're, we're, we're close enough. We're close enough to be able to hear Jesus. But we're just far enough away that we still have some control. But I'm going to invite you to let go of that control. Say, Jesus, if this is what you call me to, then I'm all in, because I want to be with you, and I want to be in your house, and I want to share in the experience of life. My hope is that we would respond very similarly to how Peter responds. Remember, Peter's pretty indignant. Peter doesn't want to do what Jesus is calling him to do or asking or trying to do for him. But in this interaction, as Jesus begins to unpack and share his true purpose in the bigger picture, this is now Peter's response. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, my hands, my head, like all of me. Peter's like, I'm all in. Like, I didn't realize, I'm, my bad, my bad, Jesus, like, but I'm, I'm in. Like, do whatever you want. And what I love about Peter, and this is what we need to, to learn from Peter, Peter doesn't seem to be all, all, at all cared, um, he has no concern with people's perceptions, which we often do. The only thing that Peter cares about is doing what God has called him to do, which, if we're being honest, we don't always have that same posture. Peter's like, I'm, I'm here, Jesus. You do, I didn't realize, I'm, you do whatever it is you need to do here because I am fully submitted to where you're leading and what you're doing in this moment. As the scene wraps up, we read that, that when Jesus had finished washing their feet, when he finished washing the disciples' feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. He just finishes up and just goes back and sits down. Like, that's, he's just a boss. Like, no hoopla, 
No, like, hey, I just want you to know what I did was so beneath me. Like, in a moment where he could have been incredibly prideful, he took on the posture of a servant. He humbled himself to the benefit of others. And I love that about Jesus. And I, I think you see that. I know you see that. To be consistent throughout the pages of the Bible. That Jesus engages with us. He serves us. And he does it out of love. So I was thinking, what, what is it? What is it that prevents us from having that similar experience? What prevents us from engaging with every service opportunities in the same proper perspective that Jesus has? And what I realize is for so many of us, there's a tension. When it comes to service, most of us serve out of one of these two things. We serve out of guilt or we serve out of love. You see, the reason that 90% of Americans want to serve is because there's this love part of them that wants to make a difference. The reason why only 25% of us serve is because guilt is a horrible motivator. Guilt does not move people to action. Maybe for a short term, but not long term. Guilt is, is driven by obligation. But love is driven by care and concern for the person you are serving or for the cause that you were giving your time to. And what we see true of Jesus each and every time is he's motivated by love. He's motivated by his care and concern for you, for me. He cares about all of us. And it's that care that compels him to serve. It's out of love. And love always manifests itself in service to others. My youngest daughter, um, two nights ago, she, uh, she built a fort in our living room. And kids love to build forts. I don't know what it is about adults that we stop doing this, but it's, they're pretty epic, right? And so she, she gets all these things, and she, she builds this huge fort, and she sets it all up, and she's like, I want to sleep in the fort. And we're like, absolutely, you can sleep in the fort. You did all of the work. Go ahead, enjoy your night in your fort. And then she looks at my wife and I, and she's like, but I'm scared. I want one of you guys to sleep with me. And in that moment, my wife looked at me in such a way that it was like, I am not sleeping downstairs. <laughs> If, if this is happening, then it's all you. And so I was like, hey, sweetie, I love you, but why don't you go ahead and pack up that fork and head up to your room because dad's not— No, of course, I didn't do that. <laughs> because I love my child. So I slept downstairs. Because love always manifests itself in service to others. And that's what we see in Jesus. That Jesus is willing to do whatever it is that love requires him to do. And in this situation, in this scene that we looked at, what did love require? It required him to wash people's feet. But if it was something else, if love required something else, Jesus would have done that as well. So I think one of the struggles that Peter had is Peter couldn't possibly get past this notion that the God of the universe was there to serve him. That was his hang-up. And the truth is, for so many of us, that's our hang-up as well. We're thinking, no, like, God, you can't serve me. I serve you. And right now, I, I really don't have time to serve you. But one of the things we do is we build walls. We all do this. We build walls that help us compartmentalize our lives. And so we're like, hey, like, Jesus, like, I, I want you here, and I want this relationship on Sundays. But, like, when it comes to my work, like, I don't need you there. When it comes to my family or my marriage, I don't need you there. When it comes to my hobbies, like, I, I don't need you there. And so we kind of, like, pick and choose when we engage with God. And, and what Jesus is saying, he's like, look. I don't want to be in a part of your life. I want to be in all, the whole of your life. So I want it to be you and me in your work. You and me in your marriage. You and me in your family. You and me in your hobbies. That I'm here, willing 
and ready to serve you, to do whatever it takes. See, the reason why Jesus, the reason why he washed the disciples' feet, because in that moment, that was exactly what he needed to do. So let me ask you this question. What is Jesus trying to do in your life? What is it? And maybe the better question is this. What aren't you letting him do? How are you not letting Jesus serve you, to come alongside you, to offer care and love and support? See, until we're willing to move from where Peter was to where he ends up, we won't experience a God who loves us with everything, who gave his life so that you and me and all of us might have life. And it's not something that happened one time, the point of history. It's not the one way that he served us, but that each and every day, as we open up our lives and invite him in, he's there to wash our feet, to offer us hope, to help us through dark seasons. Love is what drives him. And Jesus will always do whatever it is that love requires. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for Jesus. And I feel like there's no words to it express the level of gratitude that I have, that so many of us have. But I appreciate deeply the example that he sets. The God of the whole universe would fill a basin and wash people's feet. It reminds us, God, that you don't care about status, you don't care about power, position. That doesn't drive you. It's not what motivates you. Instead, what motivates you is love. And you'll do whatever that requires. But we have to be willing to let you in. We have to be willing to take a hard look at our lives, try to figure out what you are trying to do, how you're trying to engage with us. And then, God, we have to be honest about the ways that we aren't letting you do that. And be willing to maybe for the first time let go and trust in where you're trying to lead us. To trust in what you're trying to do in each and every one of us. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, that you our love. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. I want to thank you so much for being with us this weekend. And uh, as we continue in this Jesus series, we have two more weeks left and really excited for next week um, as we kind of unpack this attribute of Jesus' love that leads to community. And so please make sure you're here with us for that. Um, if you are newer here to Lake Sawyer, I want to invite you over to the Connection Zone. We have a team of people there that would love to connect with you, love to answer any questions uh, that you have. Um, and we have a free gift for you. Uh, it's an incredible gift. It's a Tesla, so it's not really a Tesla. Um, but we have a gift for you. We'd love just to connect with you and answer any questions you have. Or if you've maybe been around here a while and you have some questions about what does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to, 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 to give your life to him? We want to invite you over there. They'd love to answer those questions as well. Guys, I hope you have an incredible week. Have a great Thanksgiving, and we'll see you here next Sunday.